So we'll be talking to, today about a portion of the research that I focus on, which is really how to understand the health, environmental, and climate change consequences of different types of strategies that we may pursue in the electricity system, and focusing on, on the United States uh, for part of, of that research. So as you probably know, energy services contribute with the largest amount to greenhouse gas emissions. And we currently in the US energy system have the emissions being slip, uh, uh, split kind of 50-50 uh, between transportation and electricity. Uh, and in that regard, the transportation emissions just surpassing those of electricity by a tiny amount right now. And so the question that I'll pose to you in terms of starting thinking about different types of, of interventions in the grid is, Tell me what you'd go for. So should assume that you have a budget constraint and that you need to think about where to site the next set of PV panels. Um, are you going to install those in California or in Pennsylvania? So I want some real answers. Um, what do you think we should do? Both? Assume that you can't do both. Your budget constraint, you have the next few set of panels, you'll need to put them in one location or another. What do you do? California, Pennsylvania. Cal so a few of the folks that did Cal mentioned California. Why California? It's sunny. The resources are good. Pennsylvania. Why Pennsylvania? What? Too many panels already in California. Okay. What else? Okay. More. Yes. It's cold. This place coal. Okay, so you could have answered me with another question, which was, what's the goal? Why are we adding those panels in, in the system? And if the goal is to maximize electricity production, you'll go for the places with the best resource. But if the goal is to displace health and environmental impacts and climate change, as I had in the first title, maybe we want to think about what is being displaced and what is being displaced, namely at the margin as we incrementally add new technologies. Again, let's think about another technology. Electric vehicles, great for the environment, right? Should we invest in electric uh, vehicles or hybrids in the United States? And does our answer change if we think other geographical contexts like China or India, right? So those are the sorts of models that I want to build and address. Um, where do we get the largest environmental benefits from deploying wind? Uh, is storage a green technology? And are we really helping the environment by deploying storage? Can we think about novel ways of pursuing mitigation strategies? For example, shuffling the ways we use data centers for video streaming. What would be the potential from that? I'm not going to be able to go over all the examples, but I'll pick a few for us to cover. But the idea is how can we measure how different interventions are going to affect the emissions? But do we care about the emissions themselves? No. We care about the damages incurred from those emissions. Let that be greenhouse gases or criteria pollutants. And the first point that I want to come across is that we can't talk about the grid in terms of average emissions factors because we have a big diverse grid where the carbon intensity and emissions intensity is quite different from state to state or a subregion to subregion. And we can't talk about damages from air pollution as one single number because that too differs widely across the country. So the same ton of SO2 emitted from a stack may have health damages in terms of premature mortality ranging from $1,000 to $15,000 depending on where you are. Why is that? Why does the same ton of pollution have such dramatic different effects? Again, not a rhetorical question. You guys can actually jump in. Population density, that's a big one, right? And then also the patterns of just the dispersion of the pollutants and where you have the highest concentrations. Okay. So we have those effects that are different regionally. And so in order to track what the implications of our choices are, we need a couple of building blocks. And the first one is to try to understand how do power plants operate and which plants are operating at the margin in different regions and in different hours. Um, so in order to do that, one of the strategies that you have is to just use simulation tools and build uh, dispatch models or even better representations that account also for transmission constraints in the grid. Uh, but a very simplistic model will go something like that. You have a merit order dispatch where you're dispatching your plants from the cheapest to the most intensive, um, the most expensive. But you want to bear in mind what the emissions intensity, and here I just have the example for CO2, of those plants. 
So imagine that you are just uh, pursuing an energy efficiency plan that is decreasing demand just a little bit at the hours of peak demand when demand is uh, uh, 12 gigawatts in this uh, made up uh, system. Okay, it may be the case that you have a natural gas power plant at the margin. And so those are the emissions that you're avoiding. Whereas if you have another intervention or energy efficiency uh, plan for lighting that is actually um, changing load at an hours of moderate load, it may be the case that you have a coal power plant at the margin with much higher emissions intensity. So we do have a way to track that. And I ideally track that as close to real time as possible and also taking into account how the operations of the system are changing due to plant retirements and new plant construction. So uh, this line of work basically does the following steps. One, to have a representation of the grid operations for all its power plants that are fossil fuel based and to identify which plant is operating at the margin at different hours and different locations. Second, merge that with information about the health, environmental, and climate uh, implications of those plants by coupling it with air quality models. And finally, plug in interventions that are changing at the margin. What is the plant that is being operated? Because you either have more solar PVs, more wind, uh, vehicle electrification, solar, more efficient buildings, and so on. So let's go back to our original question. Should we add solar panels in California or in Pennsylvania? Uh, well, a little bit more on how we went about modeling this. First of all, we had information about uh, the damages in terms of dollars per ton of premature mortality uh, associated with the emissions from plants by stack height and for each of the pollutants, SO2, NOx, and PM2.5. Again, this is kind of mapping how those damages uh, will be different across uh, the country. And, and for that, actually, in the current research, we're using several models at the time. And for the, the result that you'll see, we're using AP2, uh, which is the model that is used also by the national academies. It is a model that accounts for the dispersion of the pollutants, the chemistry in the atmosphere, the changes in concentrations, and then couples that with those response functions uh, of people exposed to those pollutants, accounting both for health and also uh, environmental effects so the health effects are the predominant ones. And finally, you need to have some judgment assumptions somehow, uh, because ideally you want to put everything in dollar terms to be able to compare strategies ones across, across another. So we monetize those impacts by using the value of a statistical life. And for um, the damages incurred from uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, that, again, could be an entire lecture and discussion about what's the value due to, that you place on the social cost of carbon. At the time, we used the guidance of an actually fairly low uh, price of $20 per ton of CO2, which was the recommendation from the U.S. agencies. For all those plants, we have their geographical location and hourly emissions. This, again, is something that is a little bit easier to do in the United States versus other locations. The United States, um, through the EPA, publishes hourly measured emissions from the stack for all power plants that are larger than 25 megawatts, both for SO2, uh, NOx, and CO2. It does not include direct uh, primary um, PM2.5 emissions. So for that, we did need to do some, some assumptions of um, Basically, we assume that the emissions of PM2.5 were proportional to the plant generation output. Uh, much more research can be done in that regard. OK. And so instead of building a simulation um, model based on dispatch and transmission constraints, what we've done was to actually take advantage that we have all this granular historical data on how the power plants have actually been operating. And so the first step was to have a metric of the hourly damages uh, associated with the plan by simply multiplying the damages by the hourly emissions. Um, and then we did a regression-based approach. So we parsed the data into 20 generation means. Let me zoom in. This is an example for Texas, for ERCOT, and just for SO2. And what we're trying to capture is what's the change in damages that you uh, incur as you have slight changes in generation. So we observed that in hours of low demand, you actually have a factor of $20 per megawatt hour for um, SO2 damages. So this means that in those hours of low demand, we're capturing some of the coal power plants that were operating at the margin. Whereas in hours of high demand, it is virtually zero, because we, we, 
We don't have coal at the margin. We have uh, natural gas. And so there are no SO2 emissions. So we do that for the different hours and different regions. In a nutshell, if you want to see to a figure, again, back to our made-up dispatch model, we're trying to capture what is the change in the emissions intensity that we see in a certain time when we have a small variation in uh, uh, total um, demand or actually total generation in our case. So this little change in emissions based on the change in generation. Uh, we do that um, at, for each of the agreed subregions, and we selected the agreed subregions because those are historically regions that are fairly independent, so there is not a lot of exchange, Th taking it into account imports and exports and their emissions intensity is quite challenging, so we kind of left it out. And so by doing that for each region and each pollutant, ultimately, we're able to have a profile of what are the damages in dollars per megawatt hour as a function of the total generation that you have in a region. Again, this is for ERCOT. Mm -mm -mm. I'll jump this one. So this first step enables us to map the damages for the electric system in the United States as it is currently operated. Now the second part of the puzzle is how do things change as you incrementally increase renewables or storage or you have vehicle electrification. So in the case of the solar wind, we had um, hourly simulated output for 35,000 locations. And so we match the output in those locations with the um, electricity generation that gets displaced or avoided to be generated by the fossil uh, power plants in those same hours. So now, some of the questions that you could ask is, OK, but are you really representing the real system by doing it that way? And it's a pretty good approximation because we're using this historical data on how plants actually reacted and how they operated at the margin when they saw those fluctuations in electricity generation. So at least for a fair amount of, of renewables, is not, it is not a bad proxy. And so we match in each of those hours of output what are the damages being specifically avoided by each of those pollutants. And then we aggregate it all up to have a sense of the damages avoided uh, per uh, megawatt of solar PV capacity or wind capacity or per megawatt hour of electricity generated during an entire year. So let's jump in a few results. In the case of solar PV, this is not surprising. This first slide is probably not surprising to you. Of course, we get the most output in the regions where we have the best solar resource. But the interesting thing is that those don't align with the best locations. If your goal as a decision maker is to avoid the effects of climate change or improve the, the health and environmental consequences associated with air pollution. So if your goal is to maximize electricity pr uh, uh, production, then the best resources will be Arizona, New Mexico, and Southern California. Indeed, a solar PV panel in Arizona will provide something like 45% more electricity than one in Maine. Now, if you want to avoid CO2 emissions, the story is quite different. And you locate your solar PV in Kansas, Nebraska, uh, or the Dakotas, right? Um, the solar resources aren't that great, but at the margin, you'll be avoiding the generation from coal power plants. And finally, yet again, you uh, select to place your solar PV systems in a different location if you want to reduce the health and environmental um, uh, damages associated with air pollution. Um, Indeed, a solar PV panel in Ohio, which you wouldn't think as the first place to deploy solar uh, PV, would provide 17 times the health benefits of a solar PV in Arizona. So let's look at the story now for wind energy. Um, so in this case, uh, you'd be better off by citing your wind power in uh, the Great Plains and through West Texas. You have really good capacity factors in those locations. And they align reasonably well with the locations where you'd have um, been able to avoid the largest amounts of, of CO2. Um, the Midwest has good wind resources and at the same time still coal power plants operating at the margin uh, in some hours. But yet again, if you want to maximize uh, the um, reduction in damages from premature mortality, you'd locate uh, indeed your um, wind farms in different locations. A few examples with uh, quantitative results, a wind turbine in West Virginia would display seven times the health effects of a wind turbine in Oklahoma and 27 times those of California. Uh, 
Okay, we can pause a little bit and think about, we have all those sets of incentives that are being provided to energy technologies. Are they, are, are they paying off? And so one of the examples will be to think about the annual benefits that we get from wind farms that are installed already. And so we did this analysis of now looking at existing wind farms, looking at their hourly production, matching it with our model, and competing the overall health, environmental, and climate change benefits that we'd have over the course of a year, uh, thanks to, um, to having those wind farms. And we come up with a rough estimate of 2.6 billion. And now we have PTC, the production tax credit subsidy that was provided to wind developers for, for wind um, generation. And a rough figure for those would be $1.6 billion. So this is good news. We're getting more in terms of the health and environmental and climate change benefits than what we're spending in the incentive. Now, let's zoom in a little bit and look at two different regions, Pennsylvania and California. We're picking a little bit on those two. Um, well, the health and environmental damages that would be avoided in uh, Pennsylvania would be almost $90 per megawatt hour. And they are just receiving the 22 cents per megawatt hour. Whereas in California, because their grid is already so clean, you're actually avoiding a fairly low amount of damages, but you're still getting the 22 cents um, um, per kilowatt hour in terms of subsidy. Very briefly, a lot of people think about storage in the grid as a green technology. Um, that will really depend on how we use storage and how it is operated. So there are a couple of policy pushes for uh, using storage, namely over here in California, with the goal of having 1.3 gigawatts of storage by 2020. Now, let's think about one of the uses of storage, which, which would be for energy arbitrage. What's this? Well, the storage operator is going to charge the device when prices are low, and it's going to sell the stored electricity when the prices are high to make money. What is generating uh, electricity when the prices are low at the margin? Well, in large portions of the country, it would still be coal. What is generating electricity at the margin that you're displacing with storage? Well, it may be natural gas or even in some locations, renewables. Um, so overall, if you use average emissions factors, you're assuming that storage is a green technology. If you account for the timing of charging and discharging and what's at the margin, that's not quite right. And the second effect that is a little bit uh, smaller, but is that you'll have energy losses by operating your storage device that also uh, consume electricity, and, and so you'd need to account for that penalty too. So we've developed a linear programming optimization model for energy arbitrage. We ran that across the country by using price data and the marginal emissions factors that you've seen previously. Um, and the first thing is that, yeah, you can get a little bit of money from uh, using storage for energy arbitrage, but the key message is that you increase emissions of CO2, NOx, and SO2 virtually everywhere across the country. So it's not a green technology anymore, at least not for the energy arbitrage applications. So I'll end with a couple of notes. The first one is that we decided to make all of these data and results publicly available for any modeler that is interested in some, uh, understanding the effects of other um, energy technologies. Um, a few folks are already using this for real decisions of procurement of renewables and where they want to do that for their climate action plans, which is great. Um, and a couple of final more big picture notes, which are that we really need a major enormous transition to sustainable energy systems, not only in this country and globally. Um, and in order to do so, really looking at this in silos, just at climate policy, just at air pollution, or just at, at uh, waste, really makes no sense. And you can actually head into directions that are misleading and, and actually leading to unintended consequences. Uh, we observe that location, temporal patterns, and behavior are all jointly going to determine the health, environmental, and climate change effects of these interventions. And today, like never before, we have enormous amount of data that would enable, enable us to make wiser decisions. This was not the case 20 years ago, but we can do that now and at a fairly low cost. And, and finally, that openness in this type of research is, in my view, critically important. So we're making all of this available to all of you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, minute.
Yes. Amen. The unclean storage of energy, if you only charge it during the day between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. when the solar is at the highest and it's definitely like a clean thing going in and then it just charges 4 to like 7 p.m., then it might not add and, and it has reduced CO2 emissions? Correct. So, so, so yes, it, things may as well change and they, they are changing like the, some of the results that I showed you that pertain to 2013 or 2015 in the figures may be already outdated given how rapidly the, the grid is changing. And so one of the goals is really to keep, keep track. One of our projects is actually trying to track how much does this need to change for storage to be at least carbon neutral or emissions neutral. So, so, so you're quite right. It, it will change. It will depend on the charging. It is the fact that for the conditions that we saw until very recently, and if you're using it for energy arbitrage, because the purpose was to be revenue maximizing, you would have problems and the emissions would increase. Yeah. And there was someone here. My question was pretty similar to this one is that is the fact that uh, battery storage can in fact increase emission only true in uh, an energy market where there are still coal uh, power plants. For example, in another country where there are no coal exploitations, um, are still a uh, battery um, not good for the environment? Yeah, so, so the results are, sp are definitely specific to the conditions that we saw at the time, so to the US market for energy arbitrage and for the emissions profiles that we had at the time. If we think about France, for example, and charging the storage device with nukes, basically you don't have any emissions when you're charging it, and you'll be displacing perhaps natural gas at peak hours. So it will be specific. The results that you'll find for different services and for different countries or region may not hold the same way that we've seen here. They will not, yeah. Um, hi, my name is Namdi from Nigeria. I'm curious as to how you monetize the damages like premature mortality and uh, with the dollar value. Do you just set a random reference point and compare different areas or is there a way you do that? Um, that's a great question. So we used the recommendations from the, um, I think at the time it was the EPA of uh, $6 million and I won't remember the base year that that was attributable to. So the $6 million would be more something like $10 million right now, so adjusted to today's dollars. But this is such, it is a judgment call and when you're deciding how to evaluate those things. Now, since we used one single number across, we then rerun the model also using different values for statistical life, the higher bound that we've seen in the literature, the lower bound we've seen in the literature, um, using different dose response functions too. Um, so all those sensitivities. And ultimately, for the air pollution, you could present everything in terms of numbers of um, additional mortality and deaths, premature deaths, rather than putting a dollar value. But if you want to start conversion, that discussion with the one of the damages from CO2, you need something. It may not be dollar units, but some sort of weighting factor that brings everything into common units, right? Um, so we, we went to that. But that's that's a big part of the discussion, should we go with that? My strategy has been to really present all the res, uh, research in those papers using also lower bounds and higher bounds, but then defer to the actual policymakers on what they should use to guide their ultimate decisions. Yeah. Well, thank you all, and once again, welcome. Yeah.